Is AI on track to kill apps as we know them for good? Stay tuned to find out some bold predictions from Meta's CTO, plus a new tool that promises to transform how you look in presentations, and the truth about how we're really using AI at work with some pretty shocking results. If you enjoy the briefing, hit the subscribe and the like button. But before we dig into their CTO's predictions for the future, this week the company has launched a dedicated Meta AI app as it attempts to beat rivals like ChatGPT. Now this standalone version of the app works pretty much like the version that's bolted on into things like Instagram and WhatsApp, but this time it's a standalone product with its own discovery feed. Now if you remember, a few weeks back it was reported that OpenAI was also planning on potentially adding some social features of its own. So the great AI convergence of features seems to be continuing. But do users really want to share what they're doing on these tools? We'll take a look at some research shortly which shows perhaps that's not the case. Meta will be hoping that this launch will put it ahead of its rivals. And this week it was also announced that Google's Gemini has reached 350 million active users. So here's a chart of the current state of play between each of the main big companies. And you can see that ChatGPT is still ahead with roughly 800 million monthly active users with Meta shortly behind at 700 million. Now these numbers are taken from a series of different sources, including antitrust lawsuit filings that were filed this week, plus other sources like Sam Altman's TED Talk. And one of the striking things you'll notice is just how far behind the likes of Copilot, Claude and Perplexity are at the moment. And there are rumors this week that Microsoft's head of AI could be under pressure in his role as he reaches the one year mark since being appointed. You'll also notice that Perplexity is bottom of that list. And this week, Perplexity took some steps to potentially address that with the announcement that they are now available on WhatsApp. So users can interact with Perplexity directly within WhatsApp and whilst its functionality is currently limited, the CEO says that it has plans to support voice mode, videos, fact checking and group chats as well as accessing its native assistant. Now this seems to fit neatly into the company's everything everywhere all at once strategy and Perplexity's Ask Perplexity service has now generated over 200 million impressions in just three months. In other AI assistant news this week, Lyft has launched its own earnings AI assistant targeting drivers. So this is designed to help drivers earn more money by creating driving plans based on information about things like airport arrivals and local events. It's currently only available by joining a waitlist, but just like Uber's own driving assistant, it shows that product teams are increasingly building chatbot features targeted to specific user segments. Other updates in AI for product teams this week include a new announcement from MasterCard. So this week, the company unveiled a new AI agent payment method that would allow users to make payments via AI agents. In a press release announcing the feature, they gave the example of a small textile enterprise that will be able to use their AI agent to handle sourcing, optimize payment terms, and manage the logistics with an international supplier. And from there, the AI agent can complete the cross-border purchase using a MasterCard corporate card token and arrange for expedited delivery. MasterCard says that it is working with Microsoft to fit into its Copilot agents ecosystem as well. So AI agents are still top of the agenda for many companies and now we're seeing this gradually roll out into specific use cases like payments. And if you're interested in learning more about AI agents and the technology behind them, then over on the Substack this week, I take a look at AI agent SDKs. So in this piece, I explore what AI agent SDKs are, how product teams can use them, along with some real world examples from the likes of OpenAI, Stripe, OnePassword and more. So head over to Substack if you're interested in that. Now let's take a look at the, some of the bold predictions from Meta's CTO. So this week, Andrew Bosworth took part in an interview with Anderson Horowitz, and he shared his thoughts on what comes after mobile and the future of consumer tech. In this interview, he summarized his current thoughts about the current state of AI, along with some bold predictions about the future. So he says that unlike past tech waves that sometimes fail to address real user needs, the current AI revolution feels substantial because it involves practical everyday problems. He also predicted, perhaps not surprisingly, given Meta's huge investment in this area, that in a post-mobile computing era, augmented reality and immersive experience will offer new ways to consume content beyond smartphones. Devices like Orion demonstrate a feature where AI glasses could replace phones, combining AI to understand physical context. An example he gave here was suggesting recipes based on visible ingredients. But here's where things get really interesting, for me at least, which is where he predicts that AI could disrupt the traditional app model. So he says that AI could shift users away from using specific apps, so for example, using Spotify for music, and instead towards expressing intentions. So in this example, you would say, play music. And then the AI would orchestrate the best service for that, which might not necessarily be Spotify. So in this vision of the future, 
users are interacting with their AI assistant first and foremost, and then the AI assistant will then take the next steps to decide how best to serve that query. It goes without saying that this comes with huge risks for companies who rely on a direct relationship with their users. And he predicts that companies may potentially lose that direct relationship as AI abstracts brand identities away, prioritizing performance and price, which could challenge businesses reliant on brand loyalty. What do you think? Is this likely to pan out as Meta's CTO predicts? Let me know in the comments below. Other leaders opining on the impact of AI this week include Duolingo CEO, and he has joined the likes of Shopify CEO and Uber CEO by saying that the company is going AI first. So this was an internal memo that was also posted on Duolingo's LinkedIn page. And in this memo, he likened the shift to AI to the company's previous bet on mobile in 2012, saying that AI has made it possible to create content that would otherwise take years. And in this case, of course, content for Duolingo is course creation. But he also said that AI will immediately hit the number of contractors that the company is hiring and that increased headcount will only be permitted if it can be proven that AI can't do the job. So this echoes other sentiments that have come from other CEOs from the likes of Shopify. As we enter an era where hiring managers have to prove that the job they're hiring for can't be done by AI. In this case, Duolingo CEO says that it is mainly content contractors that will be impacted by this, but it's not difficult to see how this could eventually spill over to other areas like engineering, particularly when you look at the current adoption rates of AI in engineering. We'll take a look at some stats in a moment on that, so stay tuned for that. But now let's take a look at some tools that you can use. And the first up is the latest release from Raycast. And if you're not familiar with Raycast, then it's essentially a productivity tool that allows you to connect to thousands of different apps, including things like Google Chrome, Spotify, Notion, and a bunch of others. This week, they announced the release of their first ever mobile app. So this includes a series of different features, including the ability to connect to multiple different AI models. So it works with ChatGPT, Perplexity, Claude, and others, as well as concepts like snippets, which are essential reusable pieces of information, quick links to access important information, and of course, a note taker that will work across all of your devices. So if you're somebody who loves to explore new productivity tools, or maybe you've used Raycast on desktop, then then the new iOS app from Raycast might be worth checking out. Next is something called Lately. And this is an app that has been doing the rounds this week because it helps you and your colleagues with one particular problem, which is punctuality. So the app works by telling you when you should leave your home or your office in order to make, in order to be on time for the next meeting. And that, as well as that, it comes with some gamification elements, which helps you to become a more punctual person. So if you or any of your colleagues struggle with punctuality, then take a look at Lately. And finally, this is a new product from the founder of Evernote that is designed to inject some personality into your presentations. This is called Airtime, and it's the new name for a previous app that was called mm -hmm, which is pretty difficult to pronounce. But Airtime is designed to allow you to create both video recordings that you can share with peers and also integrate directly into Zoom. So if you're looking for ways to transform the way you present information, both at work and at home, then take a look at Airtime. Now let's explore some product data and trends from the week. And first up is a new economic index report from Anthropic. So in this report, they share how development teams are using Claude. And they say that JavaScript and TypeScript are the most popular programming languages for software engineers, which accounts for over 30% of development time. And as well as that, they break out some of the top use cases for engineering teams. And as you can see from this graph, software architecture and core design is number one with and UX component development in second place, followed by debugging and performance optimization. So this data was analyzed from both Claude.ai and Claude Code, and it gives you an idea of the types of things that engineers are building. And continuing this trend of using AI for code, speaking at Meta's inaugural Llama conference this week, Microsoft CEO says that between 20 and 30% of all code at Microsoft is now AI generated. And Mark Zuckerberg predicted with, that within the next year, that number could reach over 50% at Meta. And beyond software engineering teams, a new report this week from KPMG shows us how we're all really using AI at work. So this report is pretty in depth and it's called The Trust Attitudes and Use of Artificial Intelligence, which is a global study. As part of this, they surveyed over 48,000 people across 47 different countries. And what they found was pretty interesting, actually. They said that 57% of workers hide the use of AI at work from their boss because they don't want to be seen as somebody who's not pulling their weight. And they also found that almost half of employees say that they've used AI at work in non-compliant ways. Some of the examples they include here include things like uploading company information, such as financial, sales, or customer information, 
into public AI tools, which is actually pretty shocking when you think about it. Now, earlier in the briefing, we said that Meta AI and OpenAI are both launching social features into their AI products. But this data shows that for many people at least, using these AI tools is a pretty personal experience. So on one hand, you've got these companies like Meta and OpenAI building social features. But on the other, the people who are using these tools at work actually don't tell anyone about it. So whilst there's definitely a case for generative AI and sharing the creations that you make with generative AI, at work at least, using AI is still a pretty private activity. Elsewhere this week, a bunch of companies posted their earnings reports. And one of those was Snapchat. And this week they announced that they'd posted revenues of over 1.3 billion, but with a net loss of 140 million. But aside from their earnings, one nugget of information that I found quite interesting from their earnings update, that's quite interesting for product teams, is that the company says that it's recently been testing a simplified version of its UX, and that this simplified version of the app led to increases in daily content views, which sounds like great news. So this simplified version of the app, which reduced the number of navigation items and created an overall more simple version of the app, actually led to increases in daily content views, particularly among more casual users. But this simplified version actually alienated power users, and so Snap CEO said that they are now planning to proceed with a new update that simplifies some elements but retains the five icon navigation. So this is quite an interesting case study in balancing the needs of casual users with power users. So if you're interested in that, take a look at their earnings letter. And other companies who announced their earnings this week was Google. And aside from their revenue reports, Google also shared some insights into how some of their new search UX is paying off. So according to the latest earnings report, they said that circle to search, which is the feature where you're able to circle something and then search for it on your mobile app, has now increased by 40% in the current quarter and that visual searches with Lens have increased by 5 billion since October. So clearly Google's investments into offering multiple ways for users to search seems to be paying off pretty well right now, even if they are facing an existential threat from other companies like ChatGPT. And finally, I leave you with this rather strange story on the psychology of users, which is that Reddit has banned a group of researchers who flooded it with bots in order to test how bots might be able to change people's attitudes. So researchers from the University of Zurich secretly infiltrated a subreddit and flooded these forums with AI-generated content to see if they could change people's views. The University of Zurich has said that they are aware of the incident and that they will perform their own investigation, but this incident does show us how AI can be used by malicious actors in order to change public opinion on important topics. And on that note, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much for listening and watching. I'll be back next week with another briefing.